All right, uh, welcome everyone to the UNC Core Center for Clinical Research Speaker Series. We appreciate you taking the time to join us for this presentation. Our presenter today is Jeffrey Katz. Dr. Katz is a professor of medicine and orthopedic surgery at Harvard Medical School. He is also a professor of epidemiology at the Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Additionally, Dr. Katz is the director of orthopedic and arthritis center for outcomes research at the Brigham and Women's Hospital. His research is focused on the evaluation and outcomes of musculoskeletal disorders, including carpal tunnel syndrome, lumbar, lumbar spinal stenosis, osteoarthritis, and lower extremity joint replacement. I have had the pleasure of working with Jeff since the early 1990s uh, when I was editor of Arthritis Care and Research and Jeff was an associate editor. And we continue to work together today on a number of trials, including the WeCan and TOPS. So it is a real pleasure to have him join our CCCR group today. And his presentation is titled Management of the Syndrome of Knee Pain and Meniscal Tear and Osteoarthritis. Jeff, whenever you're ready to begin, please do so. Great, thank you. Thanks so much, Lee. And yes, Lee and I gave away our, our seniority. <laughs> We've known each other for a long time uh, and every minute has been a pleasure. And it's so nice, thank you all for the invitation and um, in a variety of ways over a period of many years, I've connected both as a group and individually with uh, I think all of the faculty. So it's such a pleasure to see you and to, um, uh, also um, see some of the younger folks who are working with you. You're in a very, you're lucky, you're in a great place. So, uh, which I'm sure you realize. I'll, I'll go ahead and share my um, screen. And let's see. I'm just trying to get it to come over to slideshow. Does that look as it's supposed to look to you? Yes. Yes. Yeah. Good. And is my voice okay? It is. Okay, great. So we'll get started. So I'm going to talk about a problem that um, uh, I've been thinking about for a long time. I feel as though the more um, I learn, the more we as a community learn, the less we know. <laughs> and um, but it but the more interesting it it gets. And um, most of the work that I'll be presenting has been supported by a variety of NIH grants. Um, I also do receive some funding from Samuamed, which changed its name to uh, Biosplice for a cohort study, uh, and some funding from the Brigham from Harvard Medical School, and I'm an associate editor or a deputy editor at JBJS. So I'll start in sort of a grand round style um, to present a case, a 55 year old with three to four years of mild to moderate use related knee pain who now presents with eight weeks um, during which the pain has gotten worse. It's worse with pivoting. It's now localizing more to the medial joint line. Non-steroidals aren't helping much. The person is starting to give up valued activity. So they seek care and on exam, they have a cool, small effusion, the medial joint line is tender. And so this is a presentation that's very suggestive of osteoarthritis complicated by a meniscal tear. And the question that is raised over the course of this person's management will be how to treat them, whether to operate. Um, and, and it's interesting to note that although, as we'll discuss, surgery in this condition is controversial and has become less frequent, there are Nevertheless, over 400,000 arthroscopic partial meniscectomies or APMs done each year in people with osteoarthritis in the US, most of which for presumed meniscal tear. So, so if we think about the meniscus, uh, it is you know, perhaps both friend and foe. So on the one hand, it provides stability and load bearing. Um, there are very nice biomechanical studies of the meniscus um, that uh, demonstrate that the subchondral bone uh, below cartilage in the meniscus um, bear less load when the meniscus is intact, more when there's a tear. So when the um, uh, radial fibers of the meniscus are disrupted, it begins to fail in its load bearing capacity and the load is transferred to the bone. But then with partial resection, the load is even greater. I'm sorry, my, my slide is advancing automatically. 
Um, and indeed, clinical studies show that um, partial meniscectomy, total meniscal resection are associated with accelerated osteoarthritis, although it's not clear in these studies whether the problem is the underlying meniscus, which is a risk factor, or the surgery. Um, uh, or is uh, the meniscus sort of a foe? We do know that traumatic meniscal tear is a common source of pain and activity limitation in people who are active, say folks with pristine knees in their 20s and 30s um, uh, can develop meniscal tear. They often then have mechanical symptoms like clicking, popping, catching, giving way. Um, but we also know that meniscal tear is highly prevalent in community settings, that the prevalent increases with age, and I'll show you some data on that in a moment from Martin England, that most tears are in fact asymptomatic and that 75% of people who have radiographic symptomatic OA have tears in, on their meniscus on MRI. And in these folks, they have no more pain than those without meniscal tears. So here's Martin England's data that was done while he was in Boston. So it's from Framingham, a community survey of over a thousand individuals in which the MRIs were um, read for a variety of features. And here are meniscal tears in men and women, slightly more in men than in women, increasing with age in both sexes. And the majority of these persons with tears did not have knee pain, were asymptomatic. So if we return to the person whom I depicted a few minutes ago, we ask, first, will surgery, arthroscopic partial meniscectomy, relieve their pain, improve their function? Will it accelerate progression of underlying osteoarthritis? And if we choose a non-operative route, we ask, is having PT in the clinic any more effective than um, placebo and any more effective than doing the home exercise program? And these are all questions that we've um, tried to address in some of the studies that we've been doing. So um, let me go back to the state of the clinical science in the early um, 2000s regarding arthroscopy. Prior to 2002, there were no trials. There were a number of single arm uncontrolled studies, which tended to support the role of arthroscopy for osteoarthritis. And this was generally a lavage to get rid of debris and degenerative tissue. Mosley and colleagues at the Houston VA in 2002 published their a very innovative um, uh, trial in which they compared arthroscopic debridement in about 60 patients, arthroscopic lavage in another 60, and placebo where they just did stab wounds in the knee in another 60 and found that all three groups improved considerably over the first several weeks and their outcomes after that were indistinguishable. Um, a few years later, Sandy Kirkley and colleagues compared arthroscopic debridement um, and lavage with a rigorous PT program for OA uh, and published that uh, also in the New England Journal um, and found that the um, both groups did better, but the outcomes were um, indistinguishable. So it was established by the, by the Kirkley study, certainly, that arthroscopy was not a useful procedure for osteoarthritis per se, but it was also recognized that most arthroscopy done in patients with OA were done to address meniscal tear. So over the course of the period from um, uh, about 2007, when the Herland study was published um, through just a few years ago, there were um, several studies, I think there were eight on this slide, uh, these are randomized controlled trials that uh, generally compare um, APM, arthroscopic meniscectomy, sometimes with exercise, sometimes without, against a comparator, generally exercise in two instances, sham APM, and we'll look at each of these studies um, briefly. Um, and um, so this is the work that's been done. And I would note then in most of these, excuse me, that in most of these studies, there is crossover from the non-operative arm to the uh, operative, sorry, to the uh, operative arm um, by as much as 30%. That is to say, people randomized to get PT, didn't do well, um, spoke with their physicians and crossed over and had surgery. And that's important in the interpretation. 
So I'll just review a couple of these studies, uh, uh, several of these studies in the next five minutes or so. Sylvia Herland and colleagues from Stockholm um, were the first out of the gate with a fairly small study that was published in 2013, and then their follow-up was published six years later in which they randomized people to an exercise regimen or the same exercise regimen plus surgery. The surgical group is in red, and you can see that the outcomes are quite similar between the two groups. They're not, the differences are not clinically important. They're not statistically significant. And again, about 30% crossed over from PT to APM. These are ITT results, as will be all the results that I show. So to some extent, the blue, the, the PT group, um, includes uh, quite a number of people who indeed had surgery. Um, this is an exception. The YIM study done in Korea uh, is one of the two studies I'll show that actually had no crossover. People stayed in the groups to which they were assigned for a two-year study that compared arthroscopic partial meniscectomy with an exercise-based non-operative regimen, dramatic improvement in both groups, no difference in both groups. GoFan um, is, uh, this is a, a Swedish study. This study is also distinctive because it demonstrated um, that surgery was more effective than non-operative therapy um, at three, six months, and those differences persisted out to three years. I, oh, I forgot to write here. They also had about 22 or something percent crossover. So these non-operative results are uh, include about a fifth of the sample who indeed got surgery. So this study suggested that surgery was indeed beneficial. Keist um, is a co-investigator with uh, Eva Roos in Southern Denmark. So this is a Scandinavian study, 20% crossover comparing APM with exercise therapy showing uh, just briefly an advantage for APM, but this was not clinically, uh, not statistically uh, significant. It was probably clinically important, but by 24 months, the groups are similar. Um, Van de Graaff, um, a Dutch uh, trial um, that uh, followed people for 24 months in APM versus physical therapy. Again, fairly striking improvements early on that persist with um, perhaps a slight advantage to surgery, but not a clinically important or statistically significant advantage. Again, 30% crossover. So the non-op group does include about 30% who um, have had surgery. And um, I'll focus now on Meteor, which is the study that our group led. It was a seven center study done in the US. We had 30% crossover. These are our results through 12 months. I'll show you five-year results in a couple of slides. Um, showing, you know, perhaps a minor advantage for APM in both uh, function on the left and pain on the right. Um, these differences disappear by 12 months. They're neither statistically significant uh, and probably not very clinically important. So the ITT results show very similar outcomes. Um, uh, here is a, a really rather well done meta analysis of most of the trials that I showed you. Um, which um, look at APM versus um, control. And uh, so here's the individual trials, generally showing with the exception of um, uh, GoFan, which, oh, where is GoFan? Uh, here he is, which shows um, more, yeah, more of an advantage for surgery um, that, um, uh, that the individual trials, the confidence intervals cross um, the line of no effect, but that the, um, uh, um, uh, uh, Meta-analytic estimates show a small uh, benefit on the order of um, about uh, 0 0.2 uh, standard deviations um, uh, in um, uh, uh, over placebo. This is uh, all comers, and these are people who did not have osteoarthritis, so people with KL0 or 1, um, where arguably the advantage may be a little bit more striking. I'll talk in a little bit more detail about Meteor. So let me just show you how the trial was sort of done. We randomized 350 people, more or less equally to PT and APM. In our APM group, 10 patients never got the surgery for reasons that were largely logistical, 95% did. In the PT group, as I mentioned before, about 30% or 68 crossed over. So our ITT results simply compare the PT with the APM group, and I've showed you them, are as treated results move the crossovers over to surgery. And so here we can look at what happens when we uh, uh, did that. 
Um, among people who um, did not cross over, um, the um, APM group um, demonstrates that uh, three quarters improved by more than eight WOMAC points and those who had PT and did not cross over about half improved by about eight points. So it looks like an advantage um, in this as treated analysis. Um, uh, and, um, uh, uh, oh, sorry, um, because as we see about 30% crossed over. So, so in other words, this 76% is comprised of people who did not cross over and improve by more than eight points. Um, this 54% consists of non-operative people who did not cross over and improve by more than eight points. So that's where you can see the as treated analysis shows a benefit for surgery. And in another paper, we looked at these three, three groups explicitly to um, just see the percent success, again, uh, thinking about a 10 point improvement in coos pain. So those who were randomized to PT and received PT, about three quarters had a success. Those who were randomized to APM and received it, um, about 80% had a success. Those who were randomized to PT but crossed over to APM, 80% of those had a success. And so um, this is what sort of brings up the PT group in the ITT analyses. So, so these are, are helpful, I think, to see what the pathway looks like. My colleague, Lindsay McFarlane, who many of you know, has done some really nice analyses with Meteor data, focusing on um, whether there are subsets who had differential responses to um, PT uh, versus APM. And this was a very nice analysis in which she categorized damage score on MRI as a amalgam of cartilage damage, bone marrow lesion damage, and synovitis. This is on the preoperative MRI. And we see that for people who had the most damage, these are tertiles, um, they did equally well with surgery and with PT. Whereas those who had um, less damage and those who had the least damage um, uh, did considerably better with, um, with a PT by 15 points on the coos than they did, um, excuse me, with APM than they did with PT. So it would suggest that in people who have this clinical presentation, who have very little damage on their MRI, that surgery may be um, a, a, a useful um, uh, intervention, whereas those who have a lot of damage, surgery presents really no advantages over non-operative therapy. And I think people, um, you know, in the clinical world are appreciate and, 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 and sort of um, make use of this, this principle. Here's our five-year uh, data. We, once again, these are more as treated uh, because we explicitly call out the crossovers in green. So what you see is that our crossovers actually started with more pain, uh, interestingly. So these are not randomized groups, right? They, once we have the crossovers out, we no longer have a random uh, a sample. Um, so they start worse, they get a whole lot better with surgery. Um, and then the other two groups start essentially identically. Um, and those who um, stayed in PT, in other words, those who were early successes to PT, uh, continue to do very well. So basically, these are highly clinically important changes of, on the order of 50 coos points that are maintained out to five years. Interestingly, though, when in the same group at five years, we assess whether the subjects had total knee replacement or not over a five-year period. We find that those who were randomized to PT and stayed in PT, 2% um, had a knee replacement. Those who were randomized to PT and crossed over, and those who were randomized to APM, 10% had total knee replacement. So total knee replacement appears to be associated with having meniscal surgery. And that's been a curious observation that's, um, uh, that, that we continue to, to be very interested in. Um, I'll just pause here for a moment and report some data uh, that are quite recent um, that uh, I had the pleasure of participate in, participating in with Liz Matskin, who's a, a clinician investigator at our center. Evan Perina is one of our house officers who wrote a lovely paper. So we were interested in the question, looking at Liz's data about the relationship between knee pathology and quote unquote mechanical symptoms such as um, clicking and popping and grinding and catching and walking. And what these data show is that um, if we divide our patients who had arthroscopy into those 
who didn't have tear, they were scoped for other reasons, had stable tears or unstable tears, a flap and that sort of thing. We see that catching and locking is somewhat more common in those with unstable tears. We see that grinding, clicking and popping are fairly common in general and don't seem to be related to the meniscal anatomy. Um, in the same data, we also look at the outer bridge grade, which is the uh, classification of osteoarthritis that's done arthroscopically. Catching and locking also have a very compelling sort of dose response relationship um, with outer bridge grade. The more uh, osteoarthritis uh, 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 pathoanatomically, the more of these symptoms. And they also have a dose response relationship, especially at these uh, higher amounts of damage um, with um, osteoarthritis and grinding and clicking and popping. And so these data, uh, which we sort of anticipated clinically, uh, really raise the question of whether this amalgam of symptoms um, can be um, uh, attributed accurately to meniscal tear or whether they might equally likely be due to underlying osteoarthritis and some of the mechanical phenomena that patients experience as a result of osteoarthritis. And I have found these data to be very interesting in trying to interpret some of the um, results of the meniscal surgery uh, trials. Um, I'm gonna show you the Chavonin trial in a moment, so I'm a little bit out of turn here, but I, I wanted to introduce at this point the question of whether there are downstream uh, radiographic or MRI imaging sequelae of doing surgery versus non-operative therapy, because that would be an important part of the therapeutic decision. So in this group, people were randomized, as I'll show you in a moment, either to a sham surgery or to APM, and their x-rays are evaluated with ORSI scores, which I think most of you have probably seen, which evaluate osteophytes and joint space narrowing. And what you can see is that the placebo uh, and then now we're looking at the change in ORSI score between baseline uh, and five years. And we can see that the placebo group, um, the distribution is shifted to the left. So relatively little change. And the APM, the surgical group, has a distribution more to the right. So these data suggest that indeed APM may be associated with greater progression of osteoarthritic change than placebo surgery. Um, I think most of you know Jamie Collins, my colleague, or know Jamie's work, and Jamie's done some really lovely work with the MRI data um, in, um, uh, in Meteor. We have MRIs, uh, most of our subjects at 0, 18 months, and 60 months, and what you can see is that here we look just at those randomized to APM who receive APM, those randomized to PT who received PT. So these are not random samples, but they help us understand the relationship between APM and imaging outcomes. And what you can see is that in the first 18 months after um, treatment, the APM group has a much steeper increase in a cartilage damage. And we have looked at, um, uh, sorry, at, oops, at osteophytes um, as well um, uh, and bone marrow lesions. They show similar patterns. So a much steeper increase in cartilage damage in the first 18 months. And then over the subsequent three and a half years, the two groups progress in parallel at a lower slope. So it looks like there is something that occurs after surgery that results in uh, damage, um, and, and but that that effect is um, surrenders over time to the underlying um, uh, a progression that we would see in unoperated patients. So working with some of the same co-authors and also another colleague, Yu Chao Chang, who is a statistician, um, we asked the question of whether progression in cartilage from zero to 18 months, so this period of progression, whether it is associated with worsening pain prospectively over the subsequent three and a half years from 18 to 60 months. And so what we did here is we took the cartilage surface area scores, we divided them uh, into three groups, which are more or less tertile. So this is the least uh, advance in cartilage surface area score. And this is greater, and this is the greatest amount of progression. And then we related that to worsening in pain. And what you can see is that there really is no discernible relationship. So that is to say, um, those who seemed to advance most, to progress the most, 
um, th this group, um, as opposed to those who progress less, don't seem to fare any differently with respect to pain over the subsequent three and a half years. We ask whether these imaging changes will be associated with symptoms ultimately, and it's one of the key aims of a 12-year follow-up of Meteor that is currently underway. So um, I, um, I, I mentioned, I, I, I sort of um, uh, let the tail wag the dog, and I, I talked about x-ray findings from Siobhan in earlier, but here's the trial itself. This is a really startling trial, and I think it's a beautifully done trial. It gets a lot of criticism, particularly from those who really like to do APM. Um, but this is a, a talented group in Finland operating in a couple of different centers who randomized 140 odd people in this age group with um, uh, uh, essentially no radiographic findings um, of osteoarthritis, but with suspected meniscal tear based on an MRI. They all went to the operating room in the OR. The surgeon confirmed the tear arthroscopically. A randomization envelope was opened and they either got a sham surgery, which was just a lavage, which we've shown is not useful, or an arthroscopic partial meniscectomy. And you can see that in terms of the Lishom score, which is a functional score, and in terms of pain after exercise, the two groups are um, uh, barely uh, distinguishable. This is a slight advantage for the surgical uh, group uh, as opposed to the sham surgery group um, that's probably clinically important at two months, but it, it obviously disappears by 12 months. So this is a really startling uh, and I think beautifully done study that really makes us check a lot of our assumptions. So we've seen in the studies that I've showed you that following both physical therapy and surgery, patients with meniscal tear in OA tend to improve a lot. We also see that they improve by a similar amount after a sham surgical procedure. Um, so let's just back up for a moment and think about that a little bit more conceptually. I think this is the sort of diagram that many of you have seen before. So we are thinking about a treatment and if somebody gets better uh, by let's say, you know, 20 points on a particular scale, so the patient experiences a 20 point improvement, that's the total effect, that's what they experience. As investigators, we're sort of fascinated to know what would have happened had there been no treatment and let's say that they might've gotten better by five points. Had they received a placebo and the contextual effects of placebo might have resulted in another, let's say seven points of benefit. And then what's left after that was the direct effect of treatment. So when we do a placebo controlled trial, the patient experiences, excuse me, oh, yeah, I'll go here. Um, so, so if we put that in the context of Shivonin, what we can see is that um, the, the red line, which is sham surgery, shows us um, the placebo effect. The blue line, which is arthroscopic partial meniscectomy, um, is indistinguishable, which is to say that all of the effect that we see is placebo effect. And I, I would just pause here and say that if we think about our patients, um, they don't distinguish between these things. They leave that to us. Patients um, experience the total effect um, and the total effect is quite striking here. And so this is what's led to a lot of very interesting, sometimes heated discussion is, should the results of a study such as this mean that arthroscopic partial meniscectomy simply should not be done because it's no better than sham, or because we don't offer sham, but we do offer arthroscopic meniscectomy, which has relatively low risk and affordable costs, should we go ahead and keep doing it? Because look at the benefit that it provides patients who at the end of the day don't distinguish between placebo and active treatment, but sure are grateful for this kind of benefit. So I don't have an answer for that, but I think it's an interesting question. Um, I'll finish by um, talking about tempo um, a little bit in which we, based on all the stuff that I've shown you, we're beginning to wonder how much of physical therapy itself um, is uh, perhaps contextual. And so we try to pack a few different questions into tempo, and I'll show you the design on the next slide. So we know that the, AP, the sham effect of APM is large. We don't know about the placebo effect of PT, or for that matter, what the active ingredient is, whether it's the physiologic changes, the strengthening that occurs, or an interpersonal reaction with a therapist. And then we wonder whether the same effects could be achieved with a home 
program. And so that led to, oh, sorry, let me, um, uh, I faked myself out. Let me um, also add an observation from Meteor that also just, uh, you know, made us curious. This was work that was led by James Sullivan, who's now a medical student at the um, learner program at Case Western. So James took our Meteor data and uh, along with uh, Jamie Collins, whom I've mentioned, uh, really drove this study um, and, um, and looked at the relationship between changes in strength and changes in pain with the idea that the presumption of a strengthening based PT regimen is that getting people stronger might improve their pain. So the changes in strength that we document um, in our PT group, not the surgical group, between baseline and three months were about um, uh, uh, three and a half pounds. This is the standard deviation. The, the, in, in the hamstrings, three and a half in the quadriceps, these are very small changes. The change in Coos pain was about 17 points. And the correlation between these changes in strength and the changes in pain um, were very, very small. And so 0.17 and 0.10. And so, um, you know, because the strength changes were so small, it's not, one could simply argue that we didn't strengthen people enough, and that would be fair. Um, but it does raise the question about whether pain improvements, at least in our um, PT group, which were substantial 17 points, were due to something other than the strengthening regimen. So, um, so again, that was a piece in the background as we designed Tempo, which is being done at four sites, the Brigham uh, colleagues at SUNY Buffalo, University of Pittsburgh, the Cleveland Clinic. Um, as of this month, we've randomized 780 out of a total of 856. So we're getting very close. We um, were disrupted, as you can imagine, by COVID. We would otherwise be um, have finished this summer. It's a four-arm study. The first arm gets a home exercise program uh, that's very well done, that was devised by our therapist with a DVD and a pamphlet. Arm two gets same and get three times a week, a week text to try to improve their adherence. Arm three gets what arm two does, but they do come in for to see a physical therapist, but they get a sham PT, which consists of um, uh, ultrasound with the machine brightly lit, but no energy coming out of the ultrasound machine and sort of a sham mobilization procedure. And arm four gets kind of a straight up, they get the home program plus a straight up strengthening based PT program. So, so we're hoping here to unravel, you know, the uh, between arms two and three, um, whether there is advantage to simply coming in and receiving sham and between arms three and four, whether there is an advantage um, to uh, true PT over uh, coming in and having sham PT. And we'll also learn something between arms one and two about whether this adherence intervention is useful. So just to summarize some of the results that I've shown you, um, APM uh, and PT and sham are all associated with rapid and sustained pain relief. Um, the intention to treat analysis uh, does favor APM in one trials, but in general, um, APM and PT are similar. The meta-analysis does show a small benefit of APM on pain, which is, doesn't appear to be clinically meaningful. However, several trials had 30% crossover and the as-treated analyses in these trials, and I showed you ours, um, favor APM. Uh, and also suggest, although this is a question we really need to understand better, that delaying APM may not have any penalty in terms of efficacy. Finally, sort of a drum roll, the Shivonin Finnish study suggests that APM may be no more effective than a sham surgical procedure. The total effects of both APM and sham are quite large. The total effect of PT is large. How much of that is due to placebo, we don't know. We know when we follow people out to five years that APM is associated with more rapid progression of cartilage lesions and osteophytes, but these changes don't appear to be associated with subsequent pain, at least in this five-year time frame. but they are associated with more knee replacements. So what do we conclude? I think it's reasonable to offer PT as a first-line therapy, uh, and that's really become fairly normative across the world in APM to those who don't respond. Several research questions remain um, about the benefits of non-operative therapy, uh, perhaps being due in part to placebo. 
um, about whether this rapid structural or the more rapid structural progression is worrisome clinically. And I would add just as a sort of an ethical concern, given what we know and what we don't know, should clinicians describe this association between surgery and imaging changes to their patients? I'm really not sure. I tend to be a discloser. So when I have these conversations, I do, but, um, but it's an awkward conversation because I can't really say whether those changes matter. And finally, I mentioned this because throughout Scandinavia, there's a lot of um, uh, advocacy, in particular on behalf of surgeons, interestingly, to have insurers not insure APM. And my sense is that a real thoughtful consideration of some of the placebo issues that I, uh, that I mentioned um, would lead to a somewhat different, more preference-based policy in which we don't remove options, we just try to explain the data better. So, um, uh, so here are just some thank yous to the Meteor and Tempo investigators at our various centers, to some of the really wonderful people that I work with um, in the Brigham and in uh, Boston. And I think maybe I'll stop sharing at this point and be glad to take questions. Thank you, Jeff. That was great. Um, we had a lovely presentation and a lovely comp com compilation of all that's going on. We have time for some questions. Um, if you have questions, you can put them in the chat box, or I think you could um, just, you know, it's a small enough group, raise your hand and ask the question directly to Jeff. Would it be against protocol to ask people to turn their cameras on? Oh, absolutely not. We don't. Please do. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Please turn your cameras on. Yes, that would be. We've, we've spent. We've, I agree. It's so strange to talk to. Yes, nice. we've spent two years in isolation, so it's. Yes, good. we need to. <laughs> oh, come on, Betsy. <laughs> <laughs> Betsy and I know each other well. Yes. Uh, Anybody have any questions? I, I noted that Richard had a comment in the chat that rheumatologists could do sham much cheaper than orthopedic surgeons. Yes, I suppose that's true. I didn't know how much lavage you could get out of one of those little needles, but um, so it would be a real some of the some people do criticize the finished study by saying they they did do a lavage, you know, with liters and liters of fluid and that. And that, that, you know, although there has been work on lavage, which suggests it's not efficacious from the first trial I presented um, from 2002, that, that, that is, I think, a reasonable question to be asked. And I, I would say also that Eva Roos tried to replicate the finished trial in southern Denmark. And ironically, in a way, because showing how far the pendulum had swung, was unable to complete the trial because too few people would agree to be randomized because they didn't want to be exposed to surgery. In Meteor, our biggest challenge was to get people to randomize because they really wanted to have surgery. So there really has been over a decade a change. And so Eva you know, wasn't able to finish the trial. Um, but, um, but in her trial, as far as she got through about 40 patients, um, the uh, uh, surgery was actually more effective than her sham, um, uh, and her sham did not include a lavage, it was more of a stab wound. So, so it may be that there's something to that um, critique of the finished trial. I, I'm always a little shocked that people are willing to be randomized to stab wounds, but... <laughs> yeah. So I, I think you also highlight that everything is complicated because you have to unpack what's going on in the surgery, where people are with their MRI stage. And then with the PT, there's still a lot to unpack. You know, is it the PT? Are there differences if you had a different PT? You know, how does that touch uh, do? And, and I think you're, it'll be interesting to see what you get with tempo um, yeah. in terms of starting to look a little bit at, at the PT. Yeah, yeah. Beth. Thanks, Jeff. This is a lovely talk, and I just love the way you took us through all the evidence. 
Um, and I just, uh, you alluded at the very end to whether insurers should be paying for this and whether this research should sort of inform how we spend our limited number of healthcare dollars. Um, and, and I hear you that I think, it, particularly for disease where, in osteoarthritis, where we really don't have a lot of great tools and we do have the potential to impact patients in a positive way, that we wanna have as many tools you know, that, that we can, but we want to really steward them well. So my question is really, I think, around shared decision-making with the patient, right? So how do you use what you know and what you've shared with us here today when you're sitting in front of a patient who you suspect has a meniscal tear based on clinical grounds or is having sort of escalating symptoms in the setting of underlying OA? And how, how do you approach that from a clinical perspective? Yeah, I, I do have those discussions, as do the various Meteor, you know, investigators, some of whom are right at the Brigham, so I have a chance to chat with them. And then because we have a new study, you know, we have ongoing interactions. And I think that that the direction that that you point to, Beth, is sort of where I think this investigative group who are largely surgeons who largely sort of, you know, hesitantly walked into this because in some ways, uh, and then, you know, have, you know, been very concerned that their community considers them to be traitorous for having, you know, authored this study. But I think that they have, you know, at the end of the day, landed where you did that these are preference-based choices that what so what I suggest to patients is that we know from the work that we've done that if you're willing to take sort of a medium term view of six to 12 months, you will probably land in the same place, whether we elect surgery, a surgical referral in my case, right, because I'm not a surgeon um, today or not. Um, but that the pathways differ, you know, the surgical referral, I think, for certain people and personalities and lifestyles makes a lot of sense, you know, you, so you get it over and done with, the outcome appears to be rather good, the safety issues are, you know, concerning always with surgery, but this is a pretty safe surgery, whereas 30% of people randomized to non-op did cross over and have surgery, and so I think for, and, and you find patients dividing themselves very naturally along that spectrum, as you can imagine from your own practice, some people who would rather do anything in the world than have surgery, no matter what the surgery, there's just almost a systemic kind of, you know, reluctance to have surgery, hear that and say, oh, well, you know, obviously I'll try non-operative therapy and, you know, sounds like the odds are in my favor. And if not, if I end up having to have surgery, I can deal with that. But, you know, no question what I want to do today. And um, But other people who, you know, are, you know, really just want to get back on their feet fast are much less worried about, you know, about side effects and of surgery and, you know, prefer to have surgery. And, and so, you know, I sort of try to move people in a direction of non-operative therapy, but, you know, refer when that's what patients really prefer. And, and I think a lot of our surgeons are feeling similarly um, that they're really happy to try to hold on to people. In a pragmatic sense, what most of our surgeons do and what I do um, in somebody who's quite symptomatic with, you know, again, I, I'm reluctant to say symptomatic meniscal tear because those symptom data make us realize that they have meniscal tear, they have OA, they have symptoms. How well the pathoanatomy and the symptoms correspond in, in an individual patient, not sure. But in any case, um, that symptom complex tends to be fairly responsive to injections. And so, so I inject a lot of these people and in fact, in our tempo trial, a fairly frequent thing that we find is people who are agreeable to non-operative therapy would nonetheless like to have something done today. So they get injected and then we enroll them if they're game, um, you know, one month later. And, and so, so, so that's kind of, I think, how it can play out, a preference-based management can play out. I had a question, Jeff. Um, Great talk. You showed some interesting data with other tissues within the joint being damaged, cartilage, bone marrow lesions, synovitis, that those, those people did worse. And, and I think, I'm wondering if, if those are people that probably had degenerative type meniscal tears. And if you look at a younger person with an acute meniscal injury, acute tear, say playing tennis, 
do they have better outcomes with surgery than an older adult where it's a degenerative type tear and there's other things that have already been going on within the joint? It's my strong impression that they do, but there have not been trials, op versus non-op trials in that younger group. And there haven't been formal comparisons, although they would be tricky comparisons, right? Because of the age and comorbidity differences. Um, but um, uh, um, those folks are more likely to have true locking, to have kind of bucket handle tears where you can really see the arthroscopist can see. And even on MRI, you can often see that there is a flap that is you know, getting caught. So, and they tend to have larger effusions. Um, so my impression is that, but, but I think Rich, that, that, that you're right, that that's in a sense what we draw from. My, my, my sense is that there's a sort of historical problem that's occurred here, which is that the, the clinical lessons of the 29 year old with a soccer injury who has a bucket handle tear have been pushed a generation ahead to the 59 year old with a degenerative meniscal tear. And so where we're, we attribute, because it seems very natural, the kind of mechanical phenomena that they experience in their knee to the meniscal tear, whereas they it may well be coming from the cartilage damage that occurs. And so we anticipate that those meniscal symptoms will improve with um, surgery and, and send them to surgery. And, um, and in fact, those meniscal symptoms do tend to improve, but um, but in any case, I, I think we've sort of sort of taken a, a clinical paradigm from that sports injury, essentially, and pushed it into a chronic disease clinical scenario where it at best fits uncomfortably and may not fit well at all. Brian. Thanks. This was a this is a great talk. I really enjoyed it. I have some questions just around, um, you know, loading of the limb. Um, so I was. I was wondering if um, any of the studies actually looked at that, you know, loading during walking, for instance, um, as an outcome. And, you know, particularly with the PT, right, there's some evidence to suggest that you can make people stronger, but it doesn't necessarily change the way that they load their limbs. Um, is gait retraining um, part of the, uh, of the physical therapy um, that people are doing for, you know, some of these studies that you presented. Um, and then the, the last question I have is about the surgery and loading. Are, are some of the, the sham, are they actually arthroscopies where they're not necessarily, um, you know, actually clipping any of the meniscus out, but they're putting a scope in? And if that's the case, is it possible that it causes enough effusion that afterwards people offload that limb similar to as they would after a, uh, a, a meniscectomy, right? And it, it, they get a similar effect where they, you, you actually cause offloading and that's beneficial. Yes, yes. Oh, those are all very interesting comments. I, um, um, with respect to sham, there's only been two studies. Uh, and then if we include going back to the one from 2002, three, in two of the three, they just did stab wounds. So they never entered the joint. In Fidelity, which is the Finnish Shavonin study, they did exactly as you said, they entered the joint, they verified with the diagnostic part in the diagnostic part of the scope that there was a tear. And then they either, you know, trimmed it back to a stable edge in the APM arm, or they simply did a lavage. And they did certainly leave the joint full of fluid. And so I think that in, in that study, I think what you proposed, they probably all had big effusions afterwards. And so I, I think that's a very interesting question that I don't think has really been raised. I suspect that there are individuals who have thought about the idea of gait retraining as a way of, as a strategy for unloading um, under the same supposition that you have that, that really the meniscal tear is sort of a, um, a proxy for failure to protect against overloading. I, I, but that's not, I think, the regimen that has been used in the published trial. So I don't think we, I, I may be wrong, but I'm fairly certain that, so I don't think we have really published data systematically that compares that kind of unloading um, focused, gate focused PT versus more traditional PT or surgery or both. But that, that seems like a very interesting idea, Doki. 
And Amanda's posted a question. Uh, she said, I wonder about the cost effectiveness of APM versus PT, not just the, at the time of the procedure, but also if we project that T, a total knee replacement may be 8% more likely over longer term follow up, and how this might affect the shared decision making discussion. That's a wonderful question. So Amanda, you, you know Elena well. So Elena Losina works um, you, you know, kind of very closely um, with me and leads, uh, 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 well, as you guys know, Elena has, has spent a lot of time with your group. So one of the projects that we just um, submitted, it was um, led by Elena and um, uh, Emma Williams, who's now a medical student at UC San Diego and other members of our team was a formal cost effectiveness using Meteor data plus a lot of other data from the literature because there's many inputs um, to examine the cost effectiveness of APM and um, uh, and and it's it's a rather attractive intervention from a cost effectiveness standpoint. The ICERs, the incremental cost effectiveness ratios on the order of thirty thousand dollars per quality to be cost effective. Um, you know, it first of all has to be effective. And so you could see that although these differences were small, um, the, um, the, the, the meta-analysis done by Abram and colleagues showed a small effect. Um, and the strategies that we compared were, they're essentially as treated strategies. They're, um, you know, uh, no PT, PT followed by APM if worsening or straight to APM. And so straight to APM is not very attractive under any of the circumstances really that were plausible that we examined. But, um, but the strategy of starting with PT and then electing APM if worsening um, is, quite, is quite attractive actually. And the efficacy data were from the, the actual meteor as treated data um, and then some of the various costs and things were from, you know, the published literature and the time frame where we went out, I think, five years in that study, which is sort of, I think, you know, this is not an intervention that patients or clinicians sort of think is a 15 year project. It's generally to try to get them through an episode and understanding that their knee is probably progressing and that a subsequent decision, but hopefully at least five years away, maybe whether you know to have knee replacement or not. Do we have any last burning questions? I was just gonna comment, you know, we've really learned how important the meniscus is, even in animal models of OA. The, the most common model that we use is called the destabilized medial meniscus model you know, where you cut the meniscotibial ligament and the meniscus kind of extrudes out and then you get OA changes. And primarily the cartilage damage is in that area where the meniscus would normally cover the, the cartilage. And so it seems like if you're taking out part of the meniscus in a human, you know, you're, you're removing the meniscus that might normally cover that area. So I'm wondering sort of in some people, if some damaged meniscus is better than no meniscus at all, you know, in terms yes. of uh, the coverage. Yeah, and I, I refer just briefly, and I, I actually took out the, the actual data slide just because I, I didn't want the presentation to be too long. Um, but um, there are a few studies that address this. And the one that I often show was done at HSS where they they really, um, they, they were, sort of channeling your thinking, Rich. So they, they have a cadaver model with an intact meniscus. They then do a radial tear in another set of cadavers. They do a radial tear with a partial meniscectomy in the third set of cadavers. And then finally, and this was, I think, the reason that this surgical group was interested, they, they, they do a sort of a surgical um, repair, either a primary repair or a meniscal graft, I think a primary repair. And so their question is exactly as you say, you know, um, given as compared with the native meniscus, um, how much do you lose from having a tear? And you do lose a fair bit of load protection. And then can that be restored by repairing the tear surgically? Um, not an option in our OA patients because you're sort of repairing it so to prevent OA. So that's not really done in this setting. Um, mm -hmm. 
showed that you do. Um, but then, but then the other question uh, um, was, if you have the radial tear and you go ahead and resect just the part of it that's torn back to a stable edge as you would clinically, um, do you somehow improve? Do you not change or do you further worsen um, the load bearing and, and you further worsen it? And, um, and I think that was a legitimate question because the concern was raised that once you disrupt the meniscus and it's sort of hoop tension, sort of the, the, you know, the integrity of the meniscus is presumably important to its load bearing function. So if you have a tear, even though the tissue is in place, uh, but that the, the, the hoop tension mechanism is lost, um, the, the notion was that um, resecting a small piece of meniscus might improve symptoms, but might, might not influence its function as well. But, but these biomechanical studies suggest that's probably not true. And just having the tissue in place does have load bearing you know, properties. And then I think what we're seeing clinically is it probably bears that out as well. Um, so it's, I think it's a very interesting um, issue. Thanks. And as you know, a lot of groups are working on, you know, meniscal replacements, you know, artificial yes. meniscus, growing a meniscus. So I'm sure we'll see a lot of that in the not so distant future. Yes, yes, exactly. Um, well, let me wish all of you in North Carolina and elsewhere a very, very nice um, holiday season. This was such a treat for me to have a chance to chat with you. I really appreciate the invitation and you're all doing wonderful work. So keep, keep at it. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff, and happy holidays. Season. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks Jeff. It was great. And Thanks I want to remind much. everyone to do the poll. <laughs> all right. Okay. See you later today, Jeff. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Take care. All right.